program for live coverage, the House Energy and Commerce Committee has returned for more work on health care reform. Live coverage on C-SPAN 3. Mr. Murphy, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm offering this amendment with uh, Mr. Stupak uh, that would make a fairly simple change in our Medicaid law uh, that would uh, apply to children under the age of 18 who are in juvenile detention facilities, uh, which would say to states uh, that during the time that they are in those facilities, uh, they're, if they were Medicaid eligible when they went in, that eligibility would be suspended and they would be put back on Medicaid when they come out. Uh, for the millions of or hundreds of thousands of children in this country who are incarcerated, many of them have pretty severe physical and mental health issues. Uh, and the last thing you want to happen when they get out of uh, incarceration and go back to a foster home is to have their Medicaid eligibility cut off and for them to go off of therapy or medications. So this is a simple amendment which just has you suspend that Medicaid eligibility, reinstate them when they come out of the facility, and then do an evaluation. If their circumstances have changed, then you can take them off the Medicaid rolls, but at least make sure that they have that transitional moment uh, as they head um, out of uh, institution uh, and back into the community. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'd be uh, glad to yield to the co-sponsor of the amendment, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, this is a good amendment. Federal law does not require the states to terminate Medicaid benefits for use for young people during an incarceration, but many states do. In fact, uh, there's a 2004 letter where CMS encouraged states not to terminate Medicaid benefits, but instead temporary suspend them, and that's exactly what we do here. Uh, Mr. Murphy is correct that uh, many of these youths have other problems, and cutting off their Medicaid just relates to recidivism, and uh, we're doing an injustice to young people. Um, and if you take a look at a study in New York, a 2005 study in New York of young males released from juvenile detention cities, detention facilities, 77 percent of them did not have Medicaid coverage one year after their release, despite most of them being eligible for the program. So what we're saying is just suspend them, don't terminate them because it, they have needs, medical needs, and we want to put them back on. And, and the lack of benefits for these young people really je jeopardize their community reintegration and increases the likelihood of recidivism. I'd get back to Mr. Murphy and ask all members to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Barton? I have a question of, of um, counsel. Under this amendment, if a youth is incarcerated, actually in an institution of, you know, for um, misbehavior, um, are they covered or not covered under Medicaid? Mr. Barton, um, inmates of public institutions of any sort are not eligible to receive services um, while they're in that institution. They may retain their eligibility for services outside the institution, but they are not eligible to receive services. Hey, or put that in, in plain English a Texan can understand. I don't understand what you just told me. Okay. Uh, let me try. Um, a kid who goes into one of these institutions doesn't get kicked off of Medicaid. He can't get any services on, paid for by Medicaid while he's in that institution. But say if he's in there for three months and he comes back out again and they haven't taken his card away, he can then start getting services again. This amendment would make would, would not change that. That's true. Well, what does the law. amendment do? The amendment would make them immediately eligible for Medicaid again when they get out. When they get out. When they get out. But, but they not, wouldn't be able to receive it while they're incarcerated. No, sir. So it's simply a fast track for retaining or regaining eligibility upon release. That is my understanding, sir. Okay. And that, uh, yeah. 
Mr. Gill, the gentlelady from North Carolina. Thank you. I, I just had a question. When you talk about public institution, are you talking about like jails and juvenile facilities? Are you talking about mental health places? What what all's covered? Is well, there uh, any? Ideally, the council, but we're generally talking about um, uh, in, incarceration, incarceration facilities. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I'm I'm predisposed to accept it as long as the understanding is. It's, they're not eligible for benefits while they're incarcerated. It's simply a, a way to regain eligibility or be eligible for benefits more quickly when they're released. If the gentleman would yield, that's, that's exactly the point. The point is, is simply to allow these kids not to have a gap once they emerge from prison. It doesn't change at all the fact that they're ineligible for those services once they're there. Uh, would you, uh, gentlemen, you Mr. Deal of Georgia. I'd like to ask counsel this question. Let's suppose that uh, a young person's eligibility for whatever reason has expired or for whatever reason they are not deemed eligible during the period of time that they are incarcerated. And a juvenile court judge, for example, calls a hearing and as a result of that hearing, he determines that the youth is to be immediately released from the juvenile detention facility. And for some reason the state has not brought his registration and eligibility for Medicaid up to date, are we going to be holding these young people under the provisions of this act which says that they shall not release them until they have them registered uh, beyond the period of time that the judge has ordered that they be incarcerated? Excuse me. Congressman, as I read the bottom of page two, um, they retain their eligibility, they retain their enrollment unless and until there is a determination that the individual is no longer eligible, eligible to be so enrolled. What, and then goes on to says that it should be completed before such dates so that the youth can access. So under the terms of this amendment, they, um, the state is supposed to do an eligibility, redetermination of eligibility before they are discharged. And if there is no reason to find that they are no longer eligible, they're supposed to keep their eligibility running when they're discharged. If the That's my reading. If the gentleman would yield, uh, that interpretation is correct. There's a specific provision in this bill to have states do that redetermination. So if circumstances have changed and they are no longer eligible for Medicaid, then they would not continue to be enrolled. Many, there are some states, though, that just automatically um, terminate Medicaid benefits when the, when the a child goes into the facility um, and then makes them go through the reapplication process once they get out. Um, so this simply says, as a default, uh, let's make sure there's no gap, but let's reassess while they're in prison to make sure that things haven't changed and that they should, for legitimate reasons, come off the rolls. Would the gentleman continue to yield for another question that I could ask counsel? Mr. Bart. Um, counsel, taking that as, uh, as a basis for it, um, the eligibility of this young person is based on the income level of the family of which he's a part. Is that correct? Yes, unless there are, uh, I suppose it's possible for somebody to be under the age of 18 and yet at the sa same time be an, an independent minor. But for the most part, it's on the basis of the family's income at, at, and assets. So we are now going to put a burden on the states to do a a, an assessment of the income level of this incarcerated youth's family in order to determine his continued eligibility before he can be released from a detention facility. I, I'm just concerned that we're creating a huge nightmare for overcrowded institutions that are looking for opportunities to get approval from a, a court to release this individual, and we may be putting an impediment in that process. If the, gen if, if the gentleman would yield, th there's not a mandate that they do that reassessment. It just allows them, uh, lines 22, 23, 24, uh, just acknowledge that the state uh, you know, can do a reassessment think rather than just put this uh, child directly back on the roll. So I don't think it's a mandate for some automatic new reassessment. It's an, allow, it's an allowance for the state uh, to, to do that if they think that the child's circumstances has, has changed. And if I may, um, under current Medicaid law, states are required to do periodic redetermination of eligibility at least once a year, and many states do it quarterly. 
Mr. Deal, do you wish any more time? Okay. Are we ready for the question? The vote now comes on the uh, Murphy Stupak Amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Uh, the ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Burgess, you have an amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, Burgess number 307. Will the uh, clerk inform us? Uh, do you have the amendment? Yes, sir. Is this an amendment to this title and uh, has been available for the required period of time? It has, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Burgess. Add at the end of title 19. 14, 19? <laughs> 19 of Division B, the following Section 1906, Liability Protections. A, in general. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman uh, from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank uh, the chairman for yielding. Uh, <clears throat> remembering back to the first day of this markup, the first amendment that was offered was an offer, uh, an amendment that would uh, uh, affect medical liability in, in uh, the practice of medicine, and it was that amendment was ruled not germane, and the chairman graciously allowed us an opportunity to rework the amendment to uh, to achieve germaneness, and that is what this amendment represents. And the principal difference between this amendment and the amendment that was originally offered is that the protections provided in each of the subsections shall apply in the case of a health care provider with respect to items, services, treatments for which a pr provider seeks reimbursement under Medicare, under Title uh, 18 of the Social Security Act, or under a state plan under Title 19 of such act. Uh, just to recapitulate the issues that were brought up two weeks ago on the first offering of this amendment, uh, the that many doctors are forced to practice defensive medicine, which results in millions of doc uh, dollars of unnecessary tests and procedures. Seasoned medical professionals are retiring early because staying in practice is no longer financially feasible, further contributing to our physician manpower shortage. That national across the board change in the medical justice system would lower costs and improve care by lessening the threat of uh, lawsuits and unmerited lawsuits that they often bring about, and specifically cap non economic damages $250,000 for the physician, $250,000 for the hospital, $250,000 for a nursing home or a second hospital if a second hospital was involved, a cap on wrongful death awards, $1.4 million. Expert opinions relating to physicians may only be provided by actively practicing physicians. Payment of future damages on a periodic or accrual basis. Limitations on liability for good Samaritans providing emergency health care. And Mr. Chairman, this is patterned after legislation that was adopted in my home state of Texas. It has increased charity care rendered by Texas hospitals, which rose 24 percent following the enactment of this legislation. Texas has licensed over 14,000, nearly 15,000 new physicians in the first five years after enacting this legislation. 33 rural counties have seen a net gain of ER doctors, including 26 counties that previously did not have an emergency room physician. A vote for this amendment will tell America's physicians that we are committed to putting in place reforms that will allow them to do their job free of government and special interest intervention. A vote for this Ameri amendment will tell America's patients that access to high quality affordable health care is indeed our goal. And I thank the chairman for his consideration in allowing us to rework the amendment and reoffer it. And with that, I will yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Would any other member um like to be heard on this amendment? Mr. Uh, gentleman from. Thank you. Uh, I strongly oppose this amendment. We all know the most significant way to reduce the cost of medical malpractice is to emphasize patient safety by reducing the number of preventable er uh, medical errors. According to the Institute of Medicine in its seminal report, Preventing uh, Medication Errors, its other report, To Err as Human, Building a Safer Health System, and its other report, Patient Saving, Achieving a New Standard of Care, Americans should be able to count on receiving health care that is safe. To achieve this, a new health care delivery system is needed, a system that both prevents errors and learns from them when they occur. 
This requires first a commitment by all stakeholders to a culture of safety and second needed improved information systems. According to the Institutes of Medicine, every year preventable medical errors kill as many as 98,000 Americans. The Center for Disease Control, if it included preventable medical errors, would be the sixth leading cause of death in America. The number of Americans injured each year by preventable medical errors is much larger. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement estimates that 15 million incidents of medical harm occur each year. According to the Institutes of Medicine, every day tens if not hundreds of thousands of errors occur in the U.S. healthcare system. To address this problem, the Institutes of Medicine concluded patient safety is indistinguishable from the delivery of quality care and it recommended that a new delivery system must be built to achieve substantial improvement in patient safety. Drug errors are the most common error of all. The Institute of Medicine estimates that on average every hospital patient in America is subject to one medication error each day they're in the hospital. These are called adverse drug events and the Institute of Medicine estimates that each year at least 1.5 million preventable adverse drug events occur in U.S. hospitals that add nearly $5,000 to the cost of each admission. The defensive medicine claim that is constantly being made by my friends on the other side has been researched thoroughly by the GAO and CBO and the Institutes of Medicine. They have questioned the validity of the defensive medicine claims. CBO CBO noted in its 2008 report that the evidence on defensive medicine is not conclusive and whether limits on malpractice torts have an impact on the practice of medicine has been subject to some debate. GAO issued a similar statement in its report earlier this decade, noting the overall prevalence and cost of defensive medicine have not been reliably measured. Researchers from the Dartmouth Atlas Project reached similar conclusions this year, noting that fear of malpractice suits is reported by many physicians to influence their practice, but differences in the malpractice environment explain only 10 percent of state variation in spending. One of the other things that's often claimed is that the number of physicians is declining because of this problem, when reality using the AMA's own physician characteristic and distribu distribution data these conclusions are undisputed. One, the number of doctors is increasing. It has been increasing every year uh, in the past decade. The number of doctors is increasing faster than population growth. The number has climbed steadily for decades and is twice the number of doctors per 100,000 in the 1960s. The number of doctors is increasing in every state. The ratio of doctors to population is higher in states without caps on damages in medical negligence case. In states that have caps on damages, the number of doctors per 100,000 population is 319, while states with caps on damages have a lower ratio of 283. Another known fact is that rising insurance premiums are related to market conditions and not to any claimed benefit from tort reform. How do we know this? Well, Mr. Burgess has cited the, the tort reform efforts in Texas. After that tort reform legislation was passed in 2003, the Dallas Morning News did an investigation and found that while hospitals and medical malpractice insurance carriers made millions of dollars over the next few years, no hospital or doctor cut the prices they charge patients or health insurers to reflect any savings from tort reform. And finally, the National Practitioner Data Bank, which collects statistics on medical errors and case settlements, has shown that there has been a steady decline in the number of payouts between 2002 and 2006. From the number in 2002, which is 14,391, to 2006 when those payouts were down to 11,759. So, Mr. Chairman, this is a problem that has a, a, a much effort being devoted to it, but is a problem that is not in need of solution. We need a, fa a safer patient safety system, and that's what we should be focusing on. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Burgess, recognize. Mr. Chairman, if I just have, can have a minute to uh, to respond to a few of the things that were just said. Uh, the Institute of Medicine study to Air is Human was published in when, 1998, 1999, relied on data that was collected in two hospitals, one in 1984, one in 1992. They collected data in two hospitals over that period of time. 
they extrapolated it to the rest of the country, doubled it to make sure that they hadn't missed anything. And the fact is the Institute of Medicine has not seen fit to, to do another study in the 10 years since that one was released. And we're relying on data that was collected in 1984. I would submit to you the practice of medicine has changed significantly since 1984. And if you don't believe me, I, I encourage you to believe the health care facilities in your district and get to know them. I would further submit that if you think that medical liability is not an issue for your physicians in your district, to have a visit with your county medical societies and get their take on this. I know that this bill before us has been endorsed by the American Medical Association, but I would submit to you that doctors across this country want us to face and fix this problem. They are tired of waiting, and they should make their voices heard to members on this committee. And I'll yield back. Gentleman, gentleman yields back his time. Oh, why don't you yield it no, to Mr. Gingrich? Yeah, don't, I'll be happy to yield the last Dr. five King. minutes on your side. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I thank the gentleman from Texas, my uh, fellow physician, fellow OBGYN, for, for yielding. Uh, the, the gentleman from uh, Iowa, I just heard uh, the, the end of his remarks, and he said that uh, there was no, no evidence that uh, doctors uh, uh, lowered their, their charges to, to patients want in states where, uh, such as Texas, such as Georgia, such as uh, Florida, uh, where the states had meaningful medical liability reform. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like uh, the situation with uh, all these jobs that were going to be grown by the economic stimulus package. Uh, now uh, the, the, the majority and, and the president says, well, we, we're going to either uh, grow jobs or preserve the ones that we've got. Uh, I, I, I submit to the gentleman from Iowa that, that uh, not necessarily by cutting uh, fees to patients, but just keeping them level. Uh, uh, the, the, the lowering of the, the malpractice premium uh, is very important. But the most important point uh, is to cut down on the amount of testing uh, that is, is unnecessary and in some cases downright harmful uh, and risky to patients. And uh, clearly uh, doctors, uh, those of us who spent 30 or more years practicing medicine know this all too well. You ought to test and you know they're not necessary, uh, but you do that in a defensive way. Uh, the President uh, went to the AMA in Chicago and spoke to them and, say, and when that issue was raised uh, by the AMA leadership, uh, the President uh, uh, admitted, yes, we do need meaningful uh, liability reform. Uh, he made no specific promises, but this is the opportunity for this committee uh, to change this, add to H.R. 3200, and improve it based on what the President uh, said at the, uh, to the AMA. So I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. I yield back. I support Mr. his Chairman, amendment. Gentlemen, I yield a minute to uh, Mr. Boyd. I, I thank, you, thank you, Dr. Burgess, for yielding. In the state of Indiana in 1975, we became the first state of the union to enact comprehensive malpractice reforms. It's called the Indiana Compensation Act for Patients. It became a model for other states as it balanced the needs of physicians for, affordability, for affordable liability insurance premiums with the needs of patients for good access to all kinds of care. Our law contains components that have been very effective for three decades. Our statute of limitations, limits on recovery, patients' compensation fund, a medical review panel, and the limits on attorney's fees. Now, when you balance what we're, our success in Indiana, the contiguous states of Indiana have very uh, it's very expensive to practice medicine, which means people who live in Indiana have greater access to health care. Now, when you think about the trends in jury awards and settlements, overall, 74 percent of the medical liability claims in 2004 were closed without payment to the plaintiff. Plaintiffs lost a majority of the cases that went to a jury. Of the 6 percent of claims that went to a jury in 2004, to a jury verdict in 2004, the defendant won 91 percent of the time. So when the gentleman from Iowa was talking about that there isn't a problem here that needs in source, that is in search of a solution, I think it's completely false. We all know that doctors are having to practice defensive medicine because of very aggressive plaintiff's bar. <laughs> Mr. Shattig for a second. I just want to add that it's not just defensive medicine. It is the doctors won't show and care. Last weekend I spoke with a doctor in Phoenix who was an ER doc 
Uh, and he explained to me that in their emergency room, they could not get many specialists. They could not get hand surgery specialists. They could not get, in some instances, neurologists. They could not get many doctors to show in the emergency room to handle cases in the emergency room because they did not want to expose themselves to the liability of presenting themselves there. And indeed, people were getting hurt as a result of those. People who needed a hand surgeon in an emergency room couldn't get one. Uh, people who had a stroke and needed a neurologist in an emergency room couldn't get one. This goes beyond uh, the issue of defensive medicine and cost. It goes to the issue of people not getting health care services. Gentlemen's time has expired. For the uh, uh, last five minutes, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let's get straight what we're talking about. We're talking about meritorious lawsuits where there is negligence, and you're talking about capping damages. We're not talking about trying to stem some imaginary uh, crisis of frivolous lawsuits. We're talking about defensive medicine. We can talk about that. And so what are these great savings that we're going to realize if we impose these kinds of restrictions on the right of people to seek redress from negligent acts? Well, I'm from Texas also. And the beauty of that law that we've had since 2003 is truly in the eye of the beholder, Mr. Chairman. And if the eyes belong to the victim, I assure you they don't look at it in glowing terms as have been described here today. Now, one would expect that if this was so successful that costs would be brought down, health care insurance would be available at reasonable prices, premiums would, would go down, all of that would be, I guess, an outcome. But let me, 2003 goes into effect. From 2000 to 2007, Texas health care insurance increased 86.8 percent. The average health insurance policy went from $6,638 to $12,403. Now, because of these tremendous savings that Texas has been able to realize because of this incredible law, this far-sighted law, let me give you the Texas experience. And if this is what the other states aspire to, go at it. 4.2 million Texans do not have insurance, 30 percent of our population. 1.5 million children, 21 percent, don't have coverage of any type. Now, if that's what this law has produced, go ahead and replicate it in all 50 states. It's a great experiment that did not work, but go ahead. The real sad thing about this law is that it shifts the responsibility and the liability from the negligent party to innocent parties, not just the victim, but all of those that will have to incur the cost to care for that victim, to truly compensate that victim for that injury. That's the injustice of these laws, that the negligent, culpable party is set free without truly paying for the negligent acts. Now, since when do you want to reward people and not hold them accountable? To me, liability and the exposure to liability is what instills accountability. So I would ask members of this committee, look at the Texas experience and reject it. Will the gentleman yield? Charlie Ray Ben yield. 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 I yield to Mr. Stupak. I thank the gentleman. You know, we heard all these arguments in the late 80s and early 90s in Michigan, and Michigan passed some of the most draconian laws there are, cap damages. We even have a law that says that if the FDA approves a drug, then it's all, you can't sue. The only state in the union has it. We have every reform you wanted. Well, Michigan right now, once again, the doctors are claiming we have to leave Michigan. Everything's too expensive. We can't afford to practice here. What we really need, very few doctors commit malpractice, but what we need is a registry of where they are so they can't go from state to state, hospital to hospital, and continue to commit it. Let's have some transparency into these lawsuits, and we'll see who's committing it. It's very few doctors, but don't limit the rights of the American people with all these fears that we're going to leave, you can't be able this and that. Michigan, our malpractice rates are one of the highest in the nation. And we passed everything you asked for and then some. It doesn't work. It's a false argument. We should reject it and stick up for the people who are truly injured in this country. Will the gentleman Will yield? The gentleman yield. No, I'm going to give my, my, Mr. Gonzalez controls my time. You should probably give it to Mr. Gett. Uh, to Mr. Gett. 
Thank you. Um, I, I just want to add on to, to what Mr. Stukpak was saying. Study after study shows that putting caps on non-economic damages does not reduce the cost of malpractice insurance for doctors, and it does not solve the problem. There are a lot of creative things that states have done to try to use dispute resolution with doctors and patients. But using a blunt instrument like this just is simply not going to solve a problem. And what it will do is take away legitimate lawsuits that legitimate patients might have. And so, so this is not a solution. I support finding ways to reduce medical costs. I support finding ways to reduce medical malpractice, frankly. But study after study has shown that this just doesn't work, even in states like Bart's or mine or other states that have passed caps on non-economic damages, and I'll yield back. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. All time has expired. The vote now occurs on the Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have Chairman, it. Chairman, I request the yeas and nays on this. Let's go to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Ms. DeGette. No. Ms. DeGette, no. Mrs. Caps. No. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. No. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? Mr. Weiner? Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson? No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow? Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill? No. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen? No. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? No. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? No. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney, no. Mr. Braley. I'm sorry. I apologize. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Ms. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of aye. Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Blackburn. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Mr. Boucher. No. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Gordon. <coughs> Mr. Gordon, aye. 
Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Matheson. Aye. Mr. Matheson. Aye. Mr. Rush. No. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Ross votes no. Responded to the call of the roll. Any member wish to uh, change his or her vote? Okay. Not. Clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 23 ayes and 32 nays. 23 ayes, 33 or 30, 32. 30, no. 23 ayes, 32 nays. The uh, amendment's not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Hill, do you have an amendment you wish to offer? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> yeah. I don't, I don't see why. Uh, the, may I ask the clerk if she has the amendment ready to report? I do, Mr. Chairman. And has this is this amendment qualified it for this it, it division does. and the time frame? It does. So Clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> yes, sir. Amendment offered by Mr. Hill of Indiana. Add after Without the objection, the amendment would be considered as read, and the gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Chairman, reserve a point of order. Uh, Mr. Scalise reserves a point of order. Mr. Hill, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have uh, before you uh, what I think to be a very simple amendment to fix a small problem. Uh, it affects about uh, 1,000 beneficiaries. I'm told it may be even as close as 600 beneficiaries. Under current law, Medicare beneficiaries take ownership of air fluidized therapy beds after Medicare's 13-month capped rental period. These beds are very complicated, very complex highly innovative and highly effective support services that are used to treat beneficiaries who have or at, are at risk for skin ulcers or who have severe burns, have recent skin grafts, or have been severely limited mobility and are bedridden. Most often, these are only needed for a limited period of time. And then after such time, the beneficiary may never need the use of these beds again. Under current law, the beneficiary must keep this bed when that rental period has expired. My amendment would give the beneficiary a choice on whether they want to keep a 1,000-pound bed. And if the beneficiary did not want to keep this bed, it would be picked up by the supplier, cleaned, and refitted. This was the law uh, as it existed uh, prior to 1995. Uh, it not, this uh, bill does not cost any money. Uh, it would help a lot of uh, beneficiaries who are stuck with a thousand pound bed after its use and uh, I would, would ask would, uh, would the gentleman yield some... yes is is it the gentleman's intention that this would save money by instead of Medicare or Medicaid continuing to pay rental that once basically in effect as a piece of durable metal equipment you've paid enough in rental that you pay for the bed that uh, we stop making payments in the, in the uh, individual using the bed takes ownership, which over time saves money. Is that the gentleman's intention? Well, actually, there's no monetary issue here at all, as I understand it, and as have I been told. The, the issue is these, the, the beneficiaries, sometimes who are very disabled, are stuck with this 1,000-pound bed in their house, and they don't know how to get rid of it. And so the idea is to give it back to Medicare, where many times they can refit it and reuse it again. Gentlemen, you Gentlemen, yield to me? Yes. I just uh, want to tell you that I think this uh, provision would provide that certain hospital beds are properly handled after the beneficiary no longer needs them. Uh, beneficiaries would continue to have access to these advanced beds and that help patients avoid bed sores that arise from prolonged uh, illness in the bed. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me 
and, and uh, I would urge the adoption of the amendment. Well, we are going to accept it with reserving the right at some future point if this bill miraculously goes to conference uh, to have a little more research on it. But as, as of now, we will accept the amendment. The gentleman from Louisiana withdraws his point of order. Okay. We will now proceed to a vote on the Hill Amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. We are uh, proceeding on the uh, motion to recommit on the floor on the food safety bill. And uh, since this is a bill that came out of our committee and that uh, I think it, the members want to be there uh, to uh, work on the motion to recommit and to vote for final passage. So we will take a recess. Could we handle one more? I think Dr. Murphy has an amendment that shouldn't take that long. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you have an amendment that you think will not take too long? I, I can explain it in two minutes, sir. Okay, well, uh, uh, he told me. You have an amendment at the desk. Does the clerk have Mr. Murphy's amendment? It should be MURPPA4001. Yeah, I have it. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a procedural question. Mr. Chairman, just a question of procedure. After this, uh, the Murphy amendment, and we come back, would we start on a new title or are we going to continue on this one? We will continue on this title. The, we, the minority has one more amendment to Title B after the Murphy Amendment, or two more amendments. Three? <laughs> okay. We're growing like weeds over here. Well, we uh, have a few amendments. Okay. Let, um, Mr. Uh, Murphy, uh, does clerk report your amendment? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, it is timely and okay. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute HR 3200 offered by Mr. Without Tim objection, Murphy. the amendment be considered as read. I uh, recognize Mr. Murphy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's uh, as we look at ways to save money and actually provide the best care. A study that came out of the New England Healthcare Institute noted that some 600 billion dollars uh, in costs uh, in health care can be accounted for some, by some variations in medical treatments that are sometimes regional. Uh, it says that many of the interventions vary dramatically among regions with no real explanation for the variations. They found particular evidence of rates of many specific surgical procedures that vary among geographic areas, including coronary artery bypass grafting, percutaneous coronary artery angioplasty, back surgery, hip replacement, carotid artery surgery, uh, and others. This particular amendment uh, says that in the areas uh, dealing with uh, uh, recommendations of standards or protocols uh, that what uh, the organizations would use, such as comparative effectiveness, is look at the standards and protocols established of clinical excellence of the specialty colleges and academies. Those colleges and academies would be such things as the American Academy of Pediatrics, the College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the College of Surgeons. In other words, there are things already out there that the medical specialists have established, the board certified uh, specialists have established, and this is a way to help this bill reduce uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in cost by making sure that that information is also disseminated to physicians. It should also be noted that nothing here uh, prevents anything that it may be a breakthrough in science or, or surgery or medicine from being used, but it is saying that those are some things that would be taken into account as procedures are looked at uh, to recommend. The gentleman yield? Yes, I would. Uh, this amendment would require the Center on Comparative Effectiveness Research to consult with the specialty colleges and academ academies of medicine. I think this is a sensible idea. I do have concerns about some of the specifics of the language here, but I'm happy to accept this uh, amendment and would uh, ask you to be uh, willing to work with us to improve it. Absolutely, sir. I'd love to do that. Thank Any you. further debate on the uh, Murphy Amendment? If not, let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. We will now recess uh, to respond to the votes that are coming on the House floor. After uh, the votes on the floor, I request that uh, members return so that we can further consider this uh, legislation.
members taking a break, leaving the hearing room. Some votes on the House floor expected shortly. We'll be back here live when they return. In our overnight programming on C-SPAN tonight, debate and votes on several amendments to the health care bill from today, including amendments offered by Representatives Deal, Rogers, and Barton. And you can always see the entire markup at our website, cspan.org. And we, while we wait for the committee to return to gavel back in, a briefing on Secretary of State Clinton's seven-nation trip to Ala Africa next week. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Today we have for you uh, Assistant Secretary...